Hi there, my name is Vic Veer. I'm an ENT consultant working for the NHS in central London. And at Queen's Hospital and King George's Hospital, I work as an otologist. An otologist is someone who uh, is an ear surgeon, basically. And one of the most common operations that we do in ear surgery is something known as a tympanoplasty. A tympanoplasty is an operation where you fix a hole in an eardrum. Now, what I want to do in this video is explain uh, explain the anatomy a little bit, why we do this, and what are the different ways we do this operation. Because actually, there's loads of little modifications, the little different techniques that we use. So what I'm going to start off by doing is draw lots of pictures so you really understand how the ear works, how the eardrum works specifically, and then what happens when you have a hole there, or why you even get a hole there in the first place. So the first picture I'm going to draw is a view that you'd get if you were to look directly down your ear hole. A bit like when your family doctor or GP looks down with that little instrument and sees the eardrum. And what you'll see is an eardrum sort of face on like this. Right in front of you, you'll see the, the membrane. It's just only this, this eardrum is very, very thin, a few cells thick. So you can see right through it. And on the other side, you can see a, a bone coming down one side like this. And that's called the malleus. Other people sometimes might call it the, the hammer, uh, but surgeons tend to call it the, the malleus. And this, this bone that's attached to the eardrum is very, very useful. So when the eardrum moves, the bone moves, and that moves the other bones as well inside the ear. Now, what I'll do is I'll draw that side of it right now. Now, instead of looking at the ear uh, through like this, I'm going to do a cross section through the ear. So you, the first thing you'll notice is this part of the ear, what we would call the pinna. And I'll draw that now. And you can see that pinna collects sound from the outside world and directs it into the ear canal, that the ear hole that you have. The sound is forced down this ear hole. And at the bottom of the ear canal, you'll see the eardrum. So that sound hits the eardrum and then moves the eardrum. That in turn moves that malleus, which I drew earlier, and you can see it here in a different angle now. And attached to the hammer or the, the malleus is attached to the anvil, or we would call it the incus bone. That incus bone in turn is attached to another bone called the stapes. Uh, some people would call it the stirrup. It looks like a stirrup. You know, when you go horse riding, you put your feet into this, this thing. It also looks a bit like a plunger or a masher. And the idea is that when the eardrum moves, then this plunger goes down into the cochlea. The cochlea is the inner ear. All that we've been talking about now has been the middle ear. Now the inner ear is a cochlea where it's like that seashell thing that goes round and round. So the reason for this middle ear structure is to convert sound energy, which is passing through the air, going into your ear, and convert that sound energy in the air to sound energy that's going through fluid. And so we can pick it up because as the fluid sort of vibrates around the cochlea, the little nerves in the cochlea can then transmit that information to your brain and we therefore perceive it as hearing so we can communicate, we can understand this wonderful world around us. So you can see this is all rather clever. You've got this big tympanic membrane, this eardrum, which directs the sound through to this tiny little window, which we would call the oval window. And there's these little bones in between, which work in like a lever action to, to amplify the sound a little bit. Now, as I said, this is very clever. It works very well. But when it doesn't work well, we can get into problems. And there are some common reasons why people could get a hole in their eardrum. And I'll explain that now. You see, the eustachian tube is the tube that runs from your ear, so behind the eardrum, from your ear to your nose. It's the tube that you use when you're on an aeroplane, you go like this. Because what you're really doing is forcing air from your nose into your ear behind the eardrum. What you're doing is equalizing the pressure on either side of the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. Now that's really important. If you imagine the eardrum like a real drum, like a percussion musical instrument drum, uh, you want normal amounts of air on either side. If you had a vacuum on the other side of a drum, it's sort of been sucked back in. And if that eardrum has been, or that real drum has been pulled in like this and you try and tap it, it won't work as well. You get a distorted sound. The same thing happens to our eardrums as well. You get distorted hearing and it sounds weird, like, like when you're on an aeroplane. You feel like you have to pop your ears and then you can hear normally again. Now, sometimes this tube that runs from your ear to your nose, what we would call the eustachian tube, sometimes it's completely blocked. It can't even let air in either. And so what happens is that this tube, because it's so blocked, it doesn't allow any fluid from coming through it either. So the, the middle ear, the area where those bones are behind the eardrum, 
the lining of your ear has this mucous membrane or it makes mucus and slowly it, it, it's meant to travel down the eustachian tube and go down to the back of our throats and we slowly swallow it microscopically. If that's not happening, the ear slowly fills up with this fluid to the point where you can almost see a fluid level behind the eardrum. When it gets right to the top, you find it very hard to hear at all. It's a bit like if you go back to our musical uh, drum that I was telling you about. If we filled a drum up full of water and then tried to use it, it wouldn't work very well. It wouldn't make any sense at all. You could hardly hear anything. The same thing happens to your ear. If you fill it up with uh, fluid on one side, it won't work very well. It won't transmit the, the sound energy across to your cochlea very well. And that's why we have problems hearing. And that's normally the first step. After that, if you leave fluid like glue ear for long enough, if you leave fluid anywhere in the body long enough, like in your sinuses, in your gallbladder or anywhere in your body, eventually it seems to get infected. And when this gets infected, the bacteria start multiplying and everything starts um, putting a lot of pressure on your ear. For a few days or weeks or so, you couldn't hear very well. And now you're getting terrible pain because you've got an infection. And because it can't go through the eustachian tube and escape, the pressure pushes on the eardrum and it really hurts until one point the eardrum tears, all this pus and blood and mucus comes out of your ear and you, f you feel like, oh my God, what's happened to me? But you feel a sense of relief because the pain's gone, the pressure on the eardrum has now gone. And for about four days, this stuff will sort of dribble out of your ear and then the infection will go by itself because you've got rid of that pus now. You should feel better. It almost acts like an abscess before. But now you're left with a tear through the eardrum, otherwise known as a tympanic perforation or a hole in your eardrum because that's where all the pus has come through and it's torn through the eardrum. The good news is that the eardrum manages to repair itself very, very efficiently. About 98% of people with a torn eardrum or a perforation eardrum will heal up within three months. And the way it does this is a very clever mechanism, which I've talked about in some of our other videos. It's, it's using a migratory epithelial transport system, which sounds very complicated, but what it really is is that the cells of the eardrum don't just stay still. They actually they travel out of your ear. So if you looked at the eardrum like this, you'll see that the, uh, the cells here won't just stay there, they'll travel out of the ear slowly but surely. And they go from the middle of the eardrum right to the edge and then grow out along the canal. Now you think, why, why, would, <laughs> why would the ear do this? The point is that it's very useful for getting rid of wax. Uh, we make wax to you know, kill off bugs and things like that. That's why we need wax. And we have a, all of us have a very thin, imperceptible, almost imperceptible layer of wax in our ear canals. And that's because it's slowly and constantly been transported out. If uh, I came to your ear and then with a permanent marker drew a smiley face on your eardrum, and then I came back to see you again in a three months time, I'll see that that smiley face isn't on your eardrum anymore it would have rotated out and come almost out of your ear by then. And that's the way we know that the, there's a transport system within your ear. Everything is transported out of the ear, so all the debris that can get stuck in your ear naturally gets pulled out. That's why I don't want you to put cotton buds in your ears because you're just going to disrupt that transport system. So that's very useful for wax, but it's also very useful if you have a, any damage to your ear. If you have a perforation of your eardrum, a hole there, these cells will notice this hole and then spread across there and then fix that hole. It's very, very clever. It works very well. As I said, 98% of the time it works. There are occasions, however, maybe when the, the there's a lot of infection around or, or the hole is too big, that this transport system doesn't able to fix that hole at all. And instead of going across and fixing the hole, it grows around the corner and gets stuck in that position and the cells end up growing around that hole, almost like this, we're happy with this hole, now we're going to leave it. And then it never really heals up. You're sort of stuck with this even three, six, two, five years afterwards, you've still got that hole in your eardrum. Now, in some people, this makes no difference at all. They don't even realize they've got a hole in their eardrum, but it does cause some problems. One is that there's a hole now between the outside world and the inside world. And so um, bugs in the air or particularly bugs from sort of uh, soapy water in the bath or something can get through that hole into the sensitive lining inside the middle ear. And it often gets infected when you get dirty water getting through that hole and infecting the middle ear. Then you get all this discharge coming out of your ear. You need to have drops to get rid of it. 
Now, that's not particularly helpful, but also we believe that having a particularly a large hole in your eardrum can cause disruption to your ability to hear things properly. So if we go back to that diagram where I drew before, you've got sound coming in the ear canal, and it's meant to be hitting the eardrum and moving the bones of hearing. But if there's a hole there, some of that sound energy passes right through and doesn't end up pushing the eardrum and therefore you don't get the same quality of sound going to the cochlea so you can hear it. And so sometimes people come to us and say, look, can you fix this hole so I could hear a little bit better? Now, in reality, we don't ever tell people, look, fixing a hole in your eardrum will definitely fix your hearing because it's slightly difficult to judge that and it's very hard to say, yes, definitely your hearing will come back. We can say it's likely or unlikely, but it's not something that we guarantee for this operation because generally we do this operation for stopping infections. We close off that hole so that the, the area which is meant to stay sterile or relatively sort of bodily sterile area doesn't keep getting infected by outside contaminants. Sometimes the hearing does improve and I'll try and explain because we do these techniques sometimes to improve the hearing as well as just closing off the hole. So some of the people who've been on this channel before will know that you can't just go ahead and fix any old hole if you see it. You have to think about why this hole will start in the first place. For example, if you still have eustachian tube dysfunction, i.e. that you can't pop your ears, you can do this as much as you can and air isn't getting into your middle ear, then if you patch up this hole, the whole problem will just fill up again with glue that will get infected, cause lots of pain, tear, and then you'll end up with another um, operation. It would have destroyed the operation you've just done, you have to start all over again. So we need to make sure that people are able to pop their ears. Now, if you've got a hole, you won't be able to pop your ear at all. When you do this, you'll just get air whistling out of your ear, a bit like in the cartoons. So if people can do that very easily and air can come out, then we know that the eustachian tube is working and, and that would be fine for to go ahead. But if they have an infection in that area as well, then you should get rid of that infection first before trying to do an operation. If you had an infection, uh, an infected wound on your arm, you wouldn't try and stitch that up. It doesn't work very well. You only really try and operate on, on parts of the body that aren't infected. Now, there is a sort of a whole different video where I explain, where I will explain, I haven't done it yet, where I explain how uh, we sort of deal with infections inside the middle ear, but that's not for this video. Let's stick to a very boring case where the eustachian tube is working fine, you can pop your ear, air comes out, and there's no infection, everything's sorted out, but they still have a hole which, say, keeps getting infected every couple of months and they want it sorted. The simplest way to fix this hole, particularly if it's a very, very small hole, is to scratch the lining of that hole. Now, what I mean by that is that what you're doing is just scratching around the edge, and what that does is that it reinvigorates these cells to start growing again because it's not curling around the corner anymore. You're trying to encourage it to start growing and close up that hole. And sometimes that's all you need to do. You can do it in clinic without even sort of local or general anaesthetic. Just scratch it a little bit. It's obviously not very nice, but it can be done very quickly. Scratch a hole. It should hopefully heal up by itself or if not even get small enough so that you don't get so many infections. In reality, that's quite rare for it to happen because you don't often see things that so easily to be fixed like that. Often you need to patch up this hole. And the reason for that is that we think that the reason why the, these cells end up curling around this corner is because the hole was too big. And what we need for this hole to heal up is a bit of scaffolding or a support structure. So you've um, freshened up the edge, that is, is how we uh, describe it. We freshen up this so it can start growing again, but it needs something to grow upon like this. So what we do is we put something known as a graft underneath it. Now, one of the simplest grafts we can get is something known as fascia. Fascia is like a, a lining over muscle, it tends to be muscle or, or other things. But let's talk about the muscle. There's this muscle here, temporalis muscle here, which you can sort of see if you bite down and we take a sample from the surface of that muscle, it becomes a very thin sort of almost sort of, you know, eardrum thickness type structure. And we put that underneath the eardrum like this. And so then it would sit it there like that. And then the cells grow over this and it works. It closes up the ear hole. And within a few weeks, you should have an almost um, sorted out problem. It's all been patched up. Now, in reality, 
this graph that you put underneath slowly disintegrates or, or gets reabsorbed in time. So it's, it's, a, it's a race against time. You're hoping that this scaffold will stay there long enough for these cells to grow across and heal up the eardrum before the scaffolding disappears. Now this works very well, but if the hole is much bigger, then the cells aren't going to get across this thin bit of tissue that we've taken from the muscle in time because the tissue will dissolve or, or reabsorb before it has a chance to go right across and you end up with maybe a smaller hole but still a hole left behind. And sometimes the other problem is when these cells grow across they, they don't create a, um, a thickness of the eardrum as it was before. Sometimes it becomes very very thin. It's a bit like taking the, the, the drum, the percussion instrument I was telling you about cutting out an area, leaving a, making a hole there, and trying to fill up that hole with some cling film. It won't work very well because it's so thin, it doesn't work as a drum anymore. So for quite big perforations, many people have started moving across to slightly thicker sort of grafts, the, the supporting layer underneath, because we don't want it to disintegrate too soon because we want the cells to grow right across it. So another thing that people use at the other end of the spectrum is something known as cartilage. Cartilage is this sort of gristle that keeps the structure of our ears. And often I take this sort of bit here, I take a small section of cartilage deep inside the ear so you don't really see any changes to the look of your ear. I take a small bit of that and place it underneath the eardrum and it gives that um, those cells a stable platform to grow over. Now the good thing is that cartilage doesn't get reabsorbed very well and sometimes it stays there for the rest of your life and that's great. Uh, we worry sometimes that cartilage is quite thick so an awful lot of us will sort of shape it and thin it out so it becomes as thin as we possibly can get it because we don't want a thick bit of cartilage sitting on the eardrum which may hamper the hearing ability of that eardrum later on. But actually if you look at the research on this a lot of people are saying now well actually it doesn't really matter how thick the cartilage is because the hearing levels still say the same and as long as you're careful with your operation it should be fine. The ins and outs about the graft choice and whether to use temporalis fascia or perichondrium whatever I'll talk about in another video because it's just too much for this video but there are different types of uh, graft the very thin ones like the fascia the very thick ones like a, a un sort of divided cartilage and we can use both it just depends on the situation. So now I'm going to try and explain how did I get that graft underneath the eardrum. Now in the video that you might have seen uh, from another part of my channel uh, what I did was I just got this sort of thin fascia and placed it underneath the eardrum by poking it through the hole and then lifting up. I, what I did was I put some sponge underneath in the uh, underneath the hole and then tucked it in around it so that it would just sit there and heal. That works really well. I mean the, the good thing about it is that it's a very quick operation. It takes 20 minutes or so is very quick and, and the, it's not very painful at all because you're not making any big cuts or changing the eardrum or moving the eardrum around at all so it works very well. The trouble is it doesn't work for much bigger holes as I said before because you need a bit of cartilage. Now some people might say at this point why are you going underneath anyway why don't you just slap it on top and let it heal underneath. The reason for that is that we're quite an anxious bunch as surgeons and we have noticed that sometimes if you put something on top of the eardrum and let it heal up underneath we worry that it ends up not healing uh, across like this end up healing down and you get something known as a cholesteatoma. There are videos on my YouTube channel which explain what a cholesteatoma is and, and, and the damage it can cause. But sticking to this video we often people put the uh, scaffolding underneath the eardrum and there are two ways like I said we can tuck a little bit of uh, sort of little tissue around uh, through the hole but most people generally lift the eardrum out of the way put the graft underneath and then place the eardrum back again. Now this works very well. Most of the people in, uh, in the UK do it this way by lifting the eardrum out of the way, having a look, plopping it there so you know exactly where it is, putting the eardrum back and it works exceptionally well in most hands. Although I'm not really certain if this is true or not, the Americans use a slightly different technique where they don't lift the entire eardrum out of the way to put something underneath what they do is they divide the eardrum into two. It's quite interesting. What they do is, because the eardrum is made out of three separate layers, they take the top layer off, they sort of scrape off that top layer and then put something in between, almost like a sandwich between the two top layers. Now, not many people in this country do this technique at all. And it is a lot more fiddly. It seems to take an awful lot more time. A 20 minute operation turns into 40 minutes or slightly longer sometimes. But I do use it sometimes because it is quite useful in certain situations.
You see, one of the problems about lifting the entire eardrum out the way is that the eardrum, particularly on one corner, is slightly attached to a nerve called the chorda tympani. The chorda tympani supplies taste sensation to one half of your tongue. So what happens is if you lift the eardrum, there's a chance of you stretching or damaging that nerve. Now, in most people, that doesn't make any difference at all. But in people who specialize in using their taste buds, it can interfere with their occupation, such as wine tasters or sort of very high level chefs and things like that. Things change with their sense of taste. Most people sort of taste a so it feels like they've bitten on a, um, a copper coin or something like that for a few weeks and then the sensation goes away and then none the wiser. But in some professions like wine tasters and things, you don't really want to damage that nerve at all. And lifting the top layer off prevents you from damaging that nerve to a much greater degree and then you can put the um, the graft in. Uh, th there are problems that people will quote and say look it, it changes the, the shape of the eardrum, it's a little bit more painful, takes longer, all those sorts of things but that may be a price willing that these uh, wine tasters want to take because they don't want to disturb their ability to do their job to its, uh, the top level that they do. Now after the operation, once we put the graft in place and everything seems to be nice and settled, we then have to pack the ear full of this sort of ribbon gauze. The idea behind that is that after the operation, we don't want someone to suddenly sneeze and then the graft blow out of their ear. We want to protect it. We want it to heal so this little cell, the cells can grow across and heal. Uh, so we pack the ear with something in, uh, with some gauze in the ear so they don't end up blowing it out. That's really useful. But the problem is you can't hear for three weeks or so with this stuff in your ear. And slowly over the next three months, the hearing comes back. But some people only have one hearing ear. If, if this ear had, uh, had died or was born, they were born deaf in one ear, and this is the ear that we are going to operate on, they don't particularly want to not be able to hear for up to three months after this operation. They want to be able to hear as soon as possible because a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, it's only a bit of deafness, you should be fine. But actually losing uh, hearing as a sense of a special sense is sometimes worse than losing your eyesight. We, everyone worries about losing their eyesight. But losing your sense of hearing is really bad because humans are social creatures. If you're a social creature and you can't communicate with everyone, you get depressed, you get dementia, you get all sorts of problems. You slowly withdraw from society because you're almost cut out. If you can't communicate with someone, they feel very, very isolated. It's just an awful situation to be if you can't hear the people around you. So in those patients where they don't really want to be deaf at all, they don't want the gauze in their ears, they want to be able to hear almost straight after the operation, there is an operation you can do where you get a little bit of cartilage and you make sure that that cartilage is exactly the same shape and size as the hole that you have. And then what you do is you look around the edge of the circumference of that cartilage and score out a sort of a channel. And the idea is that you just twist that in or just plop it into that area so it fits nicely. You don't have to sort of um, freshen up the edge like I was explaining before. It's a very quick, sort of simple operation. Uh, we worry about it because it's not healed over. The, 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 the cells don't grow around it and hold it still. So you could officially sort of blow it out again. Uh, but to be honest, it's never seemed to have happened before. And not many people, for some reason, in this country use this technique. But it is, I think, quite powerful, particularly with people who want to hear straight away. And that's what I normally use it for, for people who want to hear straight away after this operation. Now, some people also talk about paper moringoplasties or, or a or fat plug moringoplasty. Now, I don't often use these. I have done these operations before, but I don't often use this for lots of very boring reasons. And I'll go through that in another video if you really want me to one day. But I do want to talk about the approach to this eardrum. Now, you'll see in the video that I did, uh, which I'll link at the end, that I just went through with a camera through the ear hole and did the operation that way. I, I don't particularly like doing the operation where you're making a cut around the edge out here, unless I really have to, unless I really have to get into the bone and drill away the bone or something like that. But for this operation, which is, as I said, a very short operation, which you're just healing up the, uh, the eardrum hole, you don't often need to go around there because most of us now just use uh, sort of little um, endoscope cameras, uh, little keyhole type surgery things to, to get to that uh, inner, uh, so that middle ear perforation. Sometimes if the ear hole is very, very narrow, you can make a little cut just about here. And so just to open up the eardrum a bit so you can see past the blockage that's in there. It's also quite useful if you have a very narrow ear canal. 
Opening that up will allow air getting in there so it heals a bit quickly. You don't tend to get so many infections. That operation to open up the ear hole is called a meatoplasty, which again is another video which I'll do another day. And there are little other things you can do. Instead of using a big chunk of uh, cartilage, you can make palisades, and, and I'll quickly draw that, where you use little strips just to make it even thinner. Uh, I think these are all sort of modifications of the same operation. In general, this is roughly what we do. These are the basics I've explained in this video. Sometimes, however, when we look in the middle ear, we see that the bones aren't working very well, or some of them have been damaged, because if the eardrum has been sucked back in for a long time, the eardrum itself damages the bones of hearing, so the malleus tends to get eroded away and shorter. It doesn't work so well. And so there are operations we do that repair the bones of hearing, where we replace them or, or we we work a way around it so that you can start hearing again. So you can transmit the sounds from the newly repaired eardrum down to that cochlea. So we reconstruct that. That's called an osiculoplasty. And sadly, for the opposite time, I'm going to say that's for another day for another video. But hopefully this video was useful for you. And what I'll do is I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching this one. Bye bye.